but I'm not perfect actually insinuates the idea that perfect is the standard. Otherwise, how do we know that we are perfect or imperfectly uh, following up with what we think is best and what we think we're supposed to do? And so as we think about this, uh, we come to uh, our faith, and uh, we have these moments in our faith where we're maybe asked in a conversation uh, by our spouse or a mentor or a friend, and you're, you're at coffee, and I was in student ministry, uh, like I started when I was 19 and been in it a really long time. And so you have these conversations, right? And we have conversations as as friends and family in the faith, like, how are you doing? And once you get past the pleasantries of like, oh, I'm good, how are you? Okay, you're good, I'm good, we're all good, okay? right? No, but how are you doing, really? Like, no, really, how, how are you doing? Well, I could be better. Number one, how do you know? How do you know you could be better unless you're comparing it to something that's better? But I digress. I could be better. Well, tell me more about that. How could you be better? Well, I could be re- better in my relationship with God. I, I could be better with him. And Okay, what do you mean? Well, you know, I, I, really, I really should be spending more time in prayer. Um, I, I really, you know, I really should, uh, you know, make church on Sunday more of a priority. You know, it's kind of like if I have time, there's nothing else going on. And so you, you start making this list of all these things that you're supposed to do to be better, to do things different. Well, I could read the Bible more. And the question is, um, how do you know when you've read enough? So if you, if you pray 10 minutes a day right now, but tomorrow you up it to 30, and I said, have you prayed enough today? Yeah, 30 minutes, that's enough. I don't really need to talk to Jesus any more than that. 30 is good. Or is it when you hit one hour? Or maybe 12 out of 24 hours? Is there any point when you would say, I don't need to pray any more than that? Or I've read enough Bible, I understand everything there is to know. I read it, I'm good. I read it through one time, that's enough for me. I got it right here. How would we know it's enough? And yet, we're constantly comparing ourselves to this standard of perfect, what it's supposed to be in our mind, this idea of what we think of as reality, but really it's just a hope. And so we have this gap between where I know I am and where I want to be in whatever area of our life because we're trying to hit this standard of perfection. And it's only exacerbated by uh, Scripture uh, because moment after moment after moment, as we're reading through the Bible, we see list after list of lists, like starting with the Ten Commandments. All right, there's ten things. All right, here are the things. Don't do the things. Like, that's what I'm supposed to do, right? Ten Commandments, they're a pretty big deal, right? They're in front of courthouses and everything. And then those ten were not really being kept by God's people, and so they had to make some more. And so it was like, okay, let's look at Commandments 1, 2, and 3. Let's make some more laws that will help us figure out how to better do the three laws. All right, so we make a few laws based off of those. And then before you know it, when Jesus came, there were 613 laws that were added to the Ten Commandments in order to try to keep the original ten. I mean, it's crazy. It's this vicious cycle of trying to do all the right things and trying to check all the right boxes. And so we come to lists like the one I'm about to read to you, and it's a whole list of stuff that like, we would probably all agree, all right, we shouldn't do that. And so we find ourselves here in Galatians chapter 5. We're going to start at verse 19, and we're going to actually work backwards from this later, so you can just stay in chapter 5. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissension, factions, and envy. Am I going too fast? It's a long list drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, what happens when we read some of these words, right? Um, Sexual immorality, uh, fits of selfish rage. I mean, some of you are feeling like, like, yeah, before I was married, a whole lot of that. But I'm married now. I'm good. No sexual immorality left. All right, maybe uh, I haven't lost my temper in a long time. You know, I used to get in fights all the time. I used to whatever, you know, fill in the blank. Well, I'm good now. And so when you read this list, sometimes we find ourselves thinking about other people. And it's kind of like, yeah, isn't that the truth? This is where our world is. Oh, man, the stuff that's going on today. Yeah, people are really like this, right? And so we kind of get in our minds other people. Well, what Paul was really doing here uh, was, 
was trying to build a case with these people to say there are a whole lot of things that apply to all of us. And what happens when we translate the original text and the original scriptures into our English language is there might have been uh, a full sentence in the original to explain the idea that was being communicated. And then when it gets translated into English, which gets translated into like one word or two. And so we lose so much context. And so uh, what I've done is looked up the definitions, and I'm going to put them on the screen as I read it this time, of what he was actually saying with each of these key points. And what I would like for us to do in this room is just kind of, you don't have to do it like this so your neighbor sees, but maybe just kind of tally, tally some things up in your mind like, yeah, I dealt with that yesterday. Oh yeah, that was me this morning. Or maybe something recent for you. That's maybe not as much of a thing right now, but just a short time ago it was. And maybe we'll see ourselves in this a little bit differently. It is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. Wow. (laughs) Anybody have some garbage? Frenzies and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfied wants, a brutal temper, an inability to love or be loved. Wow. You think about that. How often do we have a hard time? This one hits me being loved. I feel like I'm unworthy. I'm not good enough. Why do I deserve that kind of love? And see, what we do there is build a wall between us and God because he loves us in spite of our stuff. And yet we put a wall between them every time that we say to ourselves, I'm not worthy of being loved. And now a relationship with God cannot exist. Therefore, it's sin and it's on the list. The vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone else. Aren't we about to learn about that during the election? Those Democrats, those Republicans, those fill in the blank. Aren't we really great at dehumanizing people and just putting labels on them instead of viewing them as people? We view them as issues, and when we view them as issues, they're just this thing over here, this group of people that believe a certain way and what's wrong with them, right, rather than looking at them as people that we actually care about and connect with. Ugly parodies of community, and I could go on, he says. (laughs) And so it's like, this is not an all-inclusive list, but he's continuing to make this list and kind of go on and on, and let me just try to communicate to you all the ways that we actually miss the mark of perfection. And so as you think about which tally marks you might have had, I think somewhere along the way, we could probably all apply that to us. And so we think through our Christian faith. We think about what is this all about, and we ask ourselves questions, well, what is life really all about? Because pretty much every day I'm in this mode. Be better, do better, show up differently, check the boxes, do the things so that I can get the raise, so that I can be the better husband, so I can be the better dad, so I can keep showing up better and better every day. So if it's not about that, well, what is it really all about? Because I keep trying to strive. I keep trying to show up and meet the standard of perfection that I actually never can. But what if, what if perfection was actually never the goal? Because when we try to achieve perfection, here's what I know happens for me, and I, I think that probably you'll identify with this as well, but when perfection is the goal, we reduce God to a commander giving us orders. In other words, it's, it's do all the right things. right? Go to church, uh, don't cuss, like don't get drunk do all the stuff. When I was growing up in church, uh, I was a teenager, and I was really, really afraid that God was going to make me marry somebody ugly and be a missionary. And it was like, you're going to follow Jesus, and you're going to do whatever it takes. And there's nothing wrong with that. Ugly people need somebody to marry also. I just didn't want it to be me. I didn't want to be the one that had to go and like never be able to have a shower because I'm a missionary somewhere else, right? And I was like afraid that that was going to be the life I was going into, but I was going to follow Jesus. You know, I like it all calls because he's my commander in chief. And so we kind of get into this mindset like this is what this is all about. I got to follow the rules. I got to do the thing. I got to toe the line. And so we do all the stuff and check all the boxes, reducing him to just simply a commander in chief following orders. Yes, sir. When perfection is the goal, we have a way of shaping our belief system to say that my will is God's will. In other words, we trade his promises for simply our hopes and wishes. 
And so sometimes we find ourselves praying prayers of things that we wish and hope for that are not actually prayers. We're just communicating, this is what I hope will happen. I wish you would do this. I really hope you change this. And I really hope you turn my circumstance around, turn it around. Can he do that? 100%. But do you know that it's his will in that moment to change your circumstance? Are you aligning yourself to his will? I'm certainly glad that Jesus was in the garden and in a moment where he knew his destination, his ultimate destination, his life on earth was going to be taken from him before he rose again and came back, it was a devastating moment. It was a crucial blow for most people from the outside looking in. The kingdom of God is dead because he said he's the kingdom of God and now they're hanging him on a cross and he finds himself in that moment. Father, if there's any other way for this to happen than for me to hang on a cross, please let it happen. I believe the heart of the Father wanted to know, wanted to communicate. But he ended that with, nevertheless, it's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. I want this circumstance to change. But not my will, but your will be done. I'm really, really glad. <laughs> I'm really, really glad that Jesus bent his will to the will of his Father and not the other way around. But when perfection is the goal, we want health, we want financial prosperity, we want all the things that we think we're supposed to have to achieve perfection. Meanwhile, often trading the promises of God to be with us in our trouble. Take heart. This is a promise of Jesus that we don't really like to hear. There's going to be trouble in this world. This is what he told his believers before he left, before he ascended into heaven. He said, there's going to be trouble in this world. That's a promise of God. But take heart, I have overcome the world. There's something bigger than what you see in front of you today. And when he is the one who is supposed to bend his will to what we think should be perfect, the standard of perfection that we're trying, we lay his will aside. Not a good place to be. When perfection is the goal, we live in disappointment. We live in constant disappointment. And so we find ourselves always in the gap between what we hope for what we wish, what we think things should be like, what we hope will happen, and we live in disappointment. I saw this image on Facebook a few uh, months ago, and I saved it, and it says this, adult life is a constant cycle of saying, I've got to get through this week every week. <laughs> and so we might feel like that, living in constant disappointment. The, the tragic thing about this post is it was a senior pastor of a church. And I'm like, how would you like to go to that guy's church this week? Like, I can imagine. It's going to be a really encouraging message. Just make it through, everybody. You can do this, all right? Pat yourself on the back and get along with it, all right? But you can see how better is only better if you're comparing it to something you think is better. Because there's still a standard. And so the very fact that we want to be better and we say things like, um, well, I'm good. Or, well, I can't complain. How do you know? How do you know you can't complain unless you're comparing it to something? Well, things are not like perfect, this perfect idea, but, but they're not as bad as they could be. So I guess I'm a little closer to this, so I can't complain. Things are all right. I'm good. Do you see how this is like a never-ending cycle? This doesn't really go anywhere, and yet it's kind of how we all live our daily lives. It's kind of how we all approach our faith so often. And so one of the evidences that I think that we have that we might be living this way, chasing the standard of perfection, could be how often we ask questions like, why? Why did this happen? Why is this happening to me? Why did that happen for them and not for me? Why did this happen to me and not to them? How? How could you have done that? How could you have been so stupid? How could I have done that? How could I have been so stupid? When? When will things change? When will things ever get better? And we might say that in the midst of an argument to our spouse, or we might just say it to ourselves, hoping and wishing and dreaming that some circumstance in our life, when this changes, well, then I'll be able to live in contentment, peace, joy, and contentment in Him and fulfillment. How, why, and when? But what if? What if this cycle of chasing perfection was never really the goal? What if the punchline was something different? What if there was something better than just better? 
In other words, what if there was something better than perfect? In student ministry, I would really get a lot of great questions uh, through the years because teenagers are discovering, what do I really believe? What am I going to believe for the rest of my I know what my parents believe. I know what others say I should believe, but what do I really believe? And so some of these questions uh, revolved around uh, difficult times in their life. And so they're struggling with something, and it could be something that they're, they're trying to overcome that they know they're not supposed to do, like a, some sin, some secret sin, whatever. And it's like, well, if God can do anything, because I grew up singing, my God is so big, my God is so strong, there's nothing he cannot do. Okay, <laughs> if you didn't grow up with that, be glad. All right, and so I, I grew up singing these songs, like, God can do anything. So if he can do anything, then why did he make me be able to sin? Why, why did he even do that? If God can do anything, why did he allow something to come into the world that would bring death and take my grandmother too quickly from me? Why did he allow my parents to get divorced when he knew I really needed them in the home? Why did God give the opportunity? If God can do anything, why did he do this? And so when you think about that, well, we know, we know that God can do anything. And so in a world where God can do anything, what did he do? Here's the punchline. Here's the thing. Here's the change in direction from chasing perfection. Relationship is the goal. Not perfection, relationship. In a world where God can do anything, he made us for relationship. And when he made us for relationship, it required free will because relationship without free will is coercion and control. That's not a relationship. And so he had to give us free will. And wherever there's free will, we know this, and any parent in the room knows this from early, early on, there's trouble. <laughs> That's mine. Don't take that away from me. I will throw a fit in this Target store and embarrass you in front of everybody, right? We know wherever there's free will, there's trouble, but there had to be free will in order to have relationship, and relationship was the goal. You think about the trouble that came into this world because of our free will. And in the midst of a people, amidst of his people, who found themselves in the midst of trouble, we find ourselves at the most popular verse in all of Scripture, made famous by every bathroom stall in America. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever will believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. In other words, it's Christmas in March. I will give you a child. This child will be born, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. His response to a world in trouble was not more tips and tricks and tools for achieving perfection. It was God with us. It was, I want to be with you in the midst of your trouble. I want to show you who I am in the midst of your difficult circumstance in the midst of your failure, in the midst of your tragedy, in the midst of your wondering, in the midst of your questions, I am there. And so his response to the world was, I'm going to come and be with you in it. It's an amazing thing, God with us. And so he said, in the midst of a world, in the midst of my creation who finds themselves in trouble, I want to communicate my love. And how did he do it? Through relationship. In other words, he was showing us that relationship is the language of love. How do we show love? How do we reveal the love of God? He told us before he left. See, some in this room, like, we're thinking, like, could it be that simple? <laughs> could it really be that simple? I mean, this is, this is, like, worse than your dad joke at the very beginning. Like, you're telling me the change in direction for my whole life is relationship is now my new goal? Yes. And so Jesus, before he left, he said, They'll know that you're mine. You'll know that you're, you're my followers by your love. Not the way you stand up and tell everybody the truth. Not the way that you show up at church every week. Not the way that you give your money. Not the way that it's love first. Do some of those things flow out of love? Yes, 100%. But it's love first, and we have to get the order right. It's relationship. Relationship is the goal. And so relationship is actually how we understand the love of God. And that's difficult because some of us grew up in a home where you hear God, the Father, called the Father, and yet you grew up in a home where you wanted nothing to do with your Father. He wanted nothing to do with you. And so in a world where we're supposed to be, un be able to understand God better through relationships, sometimes we understand Him worse. 
And now we have all these barriers in our faith where we're trying to pursue the Lord and we're trying to pursue. And we know there's enough there that I want to I follow after it. But now I've developed all of these mindsets and ideas based on my human interactions of imperfect people. And it's why he came to be the perfect one so that we did not have to. And so relationship is how we understand and experience love. And when we've experienced it for ourselves, there inevitably becomes the opportunity for us to reveal the love of the Father to others through the love that we've experienced from him ourselves. So if we go back and we look at Paul's conversation leading up to the list that we just read, all the stuff that hit all of us in this room and all of us in humanity, all the things, right? He he precedes that in Galatians 5, verse 13. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, you were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Remember, so a few verses later, he goes in and he says, the flesh is obvious. Here's what the acts of the flesh are. But he goes in and he says, instead of the flesh, here's what I want you to do. And you would think it's like, you know, I want you to go set some boundaries in your phone. Like, go and uh, turn Taylor Swift off and put Elevation Worship on instead. Like, go, go do all the things to stop doing, all the good things to stop doing all the bad things. And yet, he said the opposite. If you want to leave your flesh over here, here's what I want you to do. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. And then he repeats the words of Jesus here. And he says, for the entire law. All of the 613, all the stuff, it can really all be summed up in this. You put whatever list you want. In fact, he ends his list with saying, and I could go on. All of the things, and he's saying, I'm telling you, just love your neighbor as yourself. And if you can get that one thing, all the other things are taken care of. Relationship is the goal. We go back a few, for, a few verses further in the very beginning of chapter 5, and it says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Growing up, I thought the yoke of slavery was all the bad stuff I was doing. But what Paul is saying here is don't be enslaved to believing that not doing all the bad stuff gives you your freedom. That just checking the boxes gives you what you need. It's relationship. And so he says, mark my words. So I don't want you to be in slavery. And he begins now in verse 2, and he says, Mark my words, I, Paul. Now, this is really important because some of us know who Paul is, some of us don't. But Paul wrote a whole bunch of the New Testament after Jesus came. He's the reason why we're here. He opened up the story of Jesus and um, salvation to the whole Western world. Amazing guy. But Paul was actually an expert in the law before he had a life-changing, game-changing punchline moment with Jesus himself. And so Jesus appeared to him, but before that, Paul was an expert. In fact, he got paid to do the job of making sure that other people kept all the 613 laws. How many times, by the way, have we found ourselves in that? We wish our kids would do better, we wish our neighbors would do better, we wish our coworkers would do better, and we find ourselves being the judge of everyone else and how they should do everything better, better, better. Paul was the same thing. He got paid to do it, and not only that, he was so zealous about it that he felt a righteous indignation, and he felt sanctioned by God himself to kill people who did not follow the 613 laws well enough. And so when Jesus comes along and he says, it's no longer about the law, it's something else, now Paul has all this animosity with all of these people that they now call Christians. And so he kills Christians because they're not following God's law. Isn't that crazy? And so Paul says this, I, Paul, the one who knows the law better than anyone, the one who had everything in order, checked all the boxes, here's what I'm telling you, he says. Mark my words, I, Paul, I tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, circumcision was nothing more than the epitome of trying to fix yourself from the outside in. If you allow yourself to step into the idea that perfection is the goal, And keeping all the things and doing all the right things is the goal. Christ will be of no use to you. Wow. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is under obligation to obey the whole law. In other words, go ahead. 
You want to hold yourself to the law of perfection? You want to hold other people to the law of perfection? Just go ahead and obey them all. And surely by now, there would be many more than 613 that we're trying to follow to keep the 613. If you want to do that, it's the same thing Jesus was talking about when he was talking about do not judge one another. He was saying if you want to judge somebody by the same standard, you will be judged yourself. And so if you want to hold somebody to the letter of the law, that you have to obey the law, and that's how you get perfection, that's how you exemplify your godliness, that's how you exemplify your righteousness, that's how you truly step into salvation, then just go ahead and submit yourself to the whole law and try to obey all of it, and you stand over here while you put Christ over here, because now you have made yourself God. And so in our attempts to be like God and follow Jesus and be like Jesus, we try to be perfect like Jesus, separating ourselves from Jesus. It makes no sense. He says, you don't, even, you don't even need him anymore. You who are trying to be justified from the inside out by the things you do have been alienated from Christ, and you have fallen away from grace. If you feel far away from God this morning, it's not true. If you have people in your mind that you think are far away from God, it's not true. He's never been closer. He's standing at the door of your heart, and he's knocking. The people who fall away from grace are not those who sin, are not those who have a moral failure, are not those who step outside of what we think we're supposed to be doing all the time. Those who fall away from grace are the ones who think they can be justified by their works. Not us. We're the family of God in this room. And if we're not careful, every level we achieve toward perfection only leads us to become more unaware of our need to Christ, for Christ. What if, what if we experience this morning a repentance? What is repentance? Well, ultimately, it's a change in direction, but what has to come before a change in direction? If I'm walking this way and I need a punchline moment, I have to tell myself in my mind, I have to change the way I'm thinking about the direction I'm heading. And I have to turn this foot, okay? Now turn this foot again. Now turn this foot again and walk in a new direction. It starts in the mind. It starts by renewing the way we think. And the way that we can renew the way we think this morning is no longer to chase the goal of perfection, but to chase relationship with our Father. Relationship is the goal. And here's what happens. When we pursue relationship, the goal as the goal, we see God not as a commander giving us orders, but as a savior, giving us a lifeline. When relationship is the goal, we have a way of shaping our belief system, not to say his will is my will, but a belief system to say that God's will is to be with me in it all. When relationship is the goal, we live in contentment. We live in contentment when we know he is enough. He is enough to be with me in my sickness, he is enough to be with me in my trouble. He is enough to be with me in my questions. He is enough to be with me in my marriage, in my parenting, in the workplace, in my church, and everywhere I go. He is with me. It's enough. He is with me. It's enough. And so there comes a point in our journey where we no longer need to ask how, when, and why. We just need to know that he's with us, and we are with him. And he is in us, and we are him, and nothing can separate us from the love of God, and it is absolutely enough. And so when we repent... When we repent for believing that perfection is the goal and we step into relationship with him, we live right into what Paul wrote in Romans. For since, what was restored? It's all throughout the scripture. What did Jesus come to restore when he died? For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies, before we even knew what the law was, before we even knew how to check the boxes, he came to restore our friendship with him. We will certainly be saved through the life of his son so that now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. It's all about relationship. And he's here for you. And he's here for me. So if you would stand with me this morning. I'd love you to close your eyes for a minute. And I'm just going to ask a couple of questions that might help us with where we need to be this morning. 
How do I know if I'm chasing perfection over relationship? You might know if you carry shame for yourself and contempt for others. If you're living under a weight of shame where you feel like you're not good enough, you'll never be enough, can I tell you? You were good enough for him to come and be with you. That's enough. You were good enough for him to send his son to come and be Emmanuel, God, with you. You're good enough. If you're holding contempt for others and we're looking at other people saying that other people need Jesus more than I do, we might be in a place where we're pursuing perfection over relationship. If you're in a place where you've been trying to simply live for God and do all the right things rather than living for God, or living with God, we may be pursuing perfection instead of relationship. We're asking ourselves questions like, is my faith centered in Christ or in what Christ can do for me? Do I live in what I wish I could be or am I content knowing that Christ is with me? Relationship is the goal in our conflict with others. Relationship is the goal when those in our life fail and disappoint us. How do we restore the relationship? When a brother or sister around us, they step into something that's going to bring death and destruction to themselves or other people, restoration is the goal because relationship is the goal. And the only way for others to experience the love of God is through the relationship and how we show up for them. Relationship is the goal in our family. Relationship is the goal in our marriages. Relationship, relationship is the goal. And so, Father, this morning as we gather here as family, as we gather here in a moment to be unified, recognizing who you are, we do recognize who you are and who we are, and we are imperfect. We can never be good enough. We can never show up well enough to earn your love, and yet you have given it to us freely. And so we no longer live bound under the idea that we have to be perfect. We no longer live trying to do all the right things, but we can fully step in to your presence in our life every single day, knowing that you are with us and you are present and you want relationship with us. And in receiving your love and being loved by you, we love others around us. In Jesus' name.